Production support for Local Roots provided by... on WFSU Public Media's Local Roots. They once roamed wild in North Florida. Now it's rare to find these red wolves anywhere in the state. We look at efforts to revive this animal population. Plus, we explore the disappearing St. Vincent Island along Florida's forgotten coastline. And the Lemoyne Chain of Parks Fine Arts Festival is considered one of the best in the country. We go behind the scenes to explore the prep that goes into this annual event. Local Roots is next on WFSU. Take the local roots and journey down the roads we call our home. Welcome to Local Roots. I'm Suzanne Smith with WFSU Public Media, and today I'm at the Tallahassee Museum. The animals here at the museum are typical of what you'd find in wild Florida, but the animals in the exhibit to my left can only be found at two places in the state, St. Vincent Island and the Tallahassee Museum. WFSU producer Rob Diaz de Viegas went behind the scenes here to find out what the Tallahassee Museum is doing to help bring back the Red Wolf. Well, particularly wolves, the historical reference to them. You got Peter in the wolf, and the three little pigs in the wolf, and Little Red Riding Hood in the wolf. The wolf is always the villain in these stories, and that affects the way people feel about an animal. At the Tallahassee Museum, you can travel to a bygone era of Florida history. Part of that bygone era is a misunderstood animal that was hunted out of our area. Red wolves were once found in the southeastern United States. They ranged all the way from Texas down into Florida, up the coast to Virginia, and over to Pennsylvania. So they, they had a huge range. When the European settlers came, they decided that large predators, they didn't want to have them around. They considered them a threat to the children and livestock and that kind of thing. So we were very hard on the red wolves. And in the early 70s, a federal biologist named Curtis Carley realized that the red wolves had disappeared and they were nearly extinct. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service captured as many wolves as they could find, about 30 or so. These would be the future of the red wolf species. And they selected 14 that they felt like were good founder animals and started to reproduce them in captivity. So they started talking with zoos to see about, you know, putting breeding pairs out in different places around the country. And we really thought it was a, a good fit for us because the red wolf was native to this area. The focus of the Tallahassee Museum is the Big Bend region of Florida. Since we're focused on the panhandle of Florida, that's the wildlife that we exhibit. We exhibit native North Florida animals. So any animal that lived here could be considered an animal that we could display. We have two pairs of wolves right now. We have a male and a female that are siblings, and the male happens to be crypt orchid, so he's sterile anyhow and um, we have them off exhibit. And we have a pair of wolves that have mated now. We picked up a female that came from North Carolina about three months ago, I guess. And we have had a number of wolves here over the years. We've had three litters born here. We hope we're gonna have a litter this year. We, we're thinking, we're pretty sure that, we're, that we got bred this year. In addition to keeping them healthy and fed, the Tallahassee Museum wants to make sure their red wolves aren't bored. If an animal's just sitting in the same space day after day, they explore it and there's nothing really new to see in there. 
So we try to present them with items that they'll interact with, items that cause them to use their natural abilities. It's called environmental enrichment. Sometimes we use spray. You can buy raccoon urine or uh, different type fox urine. The stump behind me, this log, is a good example of environmental enrichment. We're going to put this in the habitat with the red wolves. It's a big log and it's hollow. You could probably put three or four people in there easily. So we anticipate that the wolves are going to be enjoying this because they naturally go into dens and things. So why is so much effort spent on an animal that some consider a nuisance? For one, it's an ecologically important species. They are an apex predator and they prefer white-tailed deer if they can catch them. And that's the reason we have so many white-tailed deer now, because we've eliminated the natural predators. We took away their natural checks. So that's, that's a big function of the predators, is to keep populations in balance. When you start taking out a whole species of animals, it's going to leave a void, and whatever niche they fill is not going to be occupied. If the red wolf disappeared, the human race would continue on. It's kind of a philosophical question, you know. Do you feel enriched because we have black bears and animals living here in the wild? Or does it not make any difference to you at all? You know, some people could care less whether these wildlife existed. But I think complete people, they're aware that, that we aren't the only thing living here and that everybody needs to have the space and the ability to make a living. For the Red Wolf, the Tallahassee Museum is one of those spaces. For WFSU, I'm Rob Diaz de Villegas. On April 15th, we'll be screening Real South, Red Wolf Revival. This documentary focuses on the only wild population of red wolves in existence. Here's a preview. Since colonization of this country, we've handpicked. We've said, we don't want this, we don't want that. What we're trying to do with the animals like the red wolf is to put them back in. We're trying to fix it, what we broke. There's only 50 or 60 or 70 animals in the whole world. You know, it's like seeing a you know, Siberian tiger or seeing a, a whooping crane or something like that. It was the first attempt in the, in the history of mankind to restore carnivore that had been determined to be extinct in the wild. North Carolina right now is the only place in the world where this extremely endangered species lives. And you can drive to the Outer Banks without even knowing. You might see a wolf crossing sign, but you might ignore it. Without private landowners, it will not succeed. And when you infringe on property landowners' rights, it's hard to reverse that. My heart would love to see the wolves succeed. History and where we are today, I don't think it's possible. You can't have these liberal regulations to harvest coyotes at night in these five northeastern North Carolina counties because you're killing red wolves. That's a violation of federal law. On the trail cam, they got a wolf, go a wolf with a collar going in front, in front of the camera with one of my chickens in his mouth. One wolf that came in my yard and ate a few chickens once in eight years. That put everybody in a little bit of a tizzy, to be honest with you. I can't see why any society would not want to protect what is meant to be here. I would hope that there is room for wildness in this country still. You know, we want the richness of American wild culture. I think people, you know, they watch all these nature shows about people living with lions in, in Africa and tigers in India and, and things like that. And back here at home, we've got this 50 pound wolf that's never gonna be a serious threat to anybody, and yet we can't find a way to save it.
WFSU will be screening Red Wolf Revival at the Tallahassee Museum on April 15th at 6 p.m. To learn more about the event and about this former predator of our local ecosystems, visit the WFSU Ecology blog. As we mentioned earlier, St. Vincent Island is the other place in Florida where you can find the rare red wolf. This barrier island has other unique aspects as well. WFSU producer Rob Diaz de Vegas went to the island with an author and an oceanographer to learn more about this remote area. Where the Apalachicola meets the warm Gulf waters And pairs of oyster catchers raise their sons and daughters And baby turtles crawl to the sea And swim the first mile on a long journey They need St. Vincent Island, rare and free Where wild things live in harmony Oceanographer Jeff Chanton and author Susan Zerulian are a married couple with intersecting professional interests. That intersection is physically located on Florida's forgotten coast and centered specifically on St. Vincent Island. St. Vincent Island is a national wildlife refuge established as a 12,500 acre sanctuary for migratory birds. As storms threaten off the coast, we explored the wildest beaches in our area. We first started coming out here about 20 years ago for recreation with our kids. Just for the exploring aspects of it. The wild aspect of it. But then about 10 years ago, the kids were gone. We had more time to talk. And we started just asking each other questions, mostly me asking Jeff questions about the same things you, you're curious about. How did this island come to be? What forces are affecting it? And we were already in love with the island and all the wild things here, so how will they be affected over the long term? That's when I started taking notes and putting together that book. It, it's been a, a good 10 years. St. Vincent Island, let it be forever a sanctuary. St. Vincent Island was created by climate change, sea level rise, and the Apalachicola River. Sea level started rising about 18,000 years ago. Barrier islands didn't form until sea level kind of reached a steady point. It was rising very rapidly at first, and then it slowed down, and that's when the barrier islands formed. And unlike most barrier islands in Florida, this is a big, thick, fat barrier island, and that's because of the high sediment supply coming from the Apalachicola River. But the island is disappearing. Well, this is a tree that used to live here. Trees like this, or any trees. That's the cedar. They don't usually live in the water. They're not, you know, they're not as uh, interested in waterfront opportunities as people are. And so one of the signs of shortline erosion is to see these dead trees and turned over trees right in the surf. St. Vincent Island is being consumed by the very forces that created it. Greenhouse gas production in a warming earth causes the oceans to warm up. And when seawater warms up, it expands and it takes up more room. So that's one component of sea level rise. And then the other component of sea level rise is the melting glacial ice on land. And so both of those things combine to raise the sea level. And that causes erosion and retreat on barrier islands like you see here. A network of dams and reservoirs in the Apalachicola, Chattahoochee, Flint Basin play a role as well. We often think of these dams in terms of the Apalachicola Bay estuary and oysters deprived of fresh water. But water's not the only thing being held back. All those dams are going to impound the sand that runs down the rivers and makes up these barrier islands, and so they become sediment-starved or sand-starved. And I think both these processes might be important on this island. Love the dolphins and the eagles and the shrimp and mullet. The pelicans are hungry for a fish in their gullet. From my small kayak, watching the plover, I vowed that I'd never let the fight be over. Keeping St. Vincent Island rare and free, where wild things live in harmony. On the other side of the island, we meet John Stark, the refuge manager. He has some good news to share. The previous record for loggerhead sea turtle nests was 104, and we had our 110th nest this morning, so this is a record year. We're pretty excited about that, and we're not into August yet, so 
We don't expect many more nests, but we do expect more nests. So this is very clearly a record year, so we're very excited about that. Loggerheads, along with red wolves, and many of the migratory birds that stop here are endangered or threatened. As St. Vincent Island changes, its ability to function as a refuge for these species will be affected. With that in mind, Jeff is pursuing a grant to measure the effects of sea level rise on the island. There are no human habitations on this island. Basically, the ecological processes that are natural to a coastal island are taking place here. So it's a really perfect lab to look at the best scenario for an island. To come here is to see Florida as it was and as it is in its most natural state for the most part. It's, it's a fairly unique experience. St. Vincent Island, let it be forever a sanctuary. Just made it. For WFSU, I'm Rob Diaz de Villegas. For more on St. Vincent Island, visit wfsu.org slash ecology blog. The annual Le Moyne Chain of Parks Festival is coming up later this month in downtown Tallahassee. These two days are filled with so much fun and fine arts, it's been named one of the country's top 100 fine arts festivals. It takes a lot of work to make that happen. I had a chance to go behind the scenes for this year's festival and see how they put it all together. So this is a full year of planning. Unless you're involved in the behind the scenes, you don't realize. Um, and and we, we find that, that people kind of start focusing about a month ahead at what's coming. We've been focusing on it, like I said, even before this festival, we've already started planning for next year. Anytime I tell anyone, oh my gosh, we're, it's so crazy busy right now, they're like, why? It's not till April. Well, the reason is, is because December 1st is the deadline for artists to apply. Tonight at midnight is going to be the final cutoff for artists to apply. And um, we've done really well. The festival's growing. We've done really well. We have a lot of applications. We are up to two, 265 plus our exempt artists who were uh, award winners last year. So we pull them out of the jury selection and we've got 13 there. So, and at lunchtime today, we were 254. So, I mean, today's the day. <laughs> it is happening. Okay, well, I'm gonna put you on speakerphone here. So if you'll hold on. Have you noticed the numbers, how much they've grown since this morning? I haven't. I'm, I'm on the website, but I'm kind of, um, you know, cruising through. Yeah. It, um... I just refreshed and another one came in. I'm just telling, that people are moving so fast now that everybody's doing everything at the last minute. Mm -hmm. It's crazy. Yeah, 279 total. So that's that's a pretty, that's even higher than before, so we're still growing. That's great, I mean, you know, we get quite a few right before midnight, so mm -hmm. I think I think we're good. We've, we've broken another record this year. Yep, yep. Okay. All righty. Okay, well, thanks, Sherry. Have a good evening. You too, Kelly. Talk to you later. Bye-bye. All right, bye. Okay, let the work begin. First time we thought we want 150 artists, so we're going to accept 150 artists, and that's not the way it works, because a lot of artists apply to multiple shows, and it just depends on who, what, what show they get into, how their schedule works, because they do a kind of a travel circuit, you know, and they don't know where they're going to be accepted, so they apply in multiple shows. So we'll have as many as 30 artists that have applied and we've accepted them and have invited them and they decline to come. So you can't say 150. So we've just learned that we essentially try to accept 
around 175. And uh, welcome, uh, 2017 is here and it's time to, to get to it here with all our planning and we're excited about this fabulous team that we've got. We've got some folks. We were kicking off our uh, 2017 schedule of meetings to plan the festival. And, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. We talked about what each subcommittee is doing. Uh, we talked about uh, PR and marketing uh, efforts and, um, and then everything that goes into the festival has a subcommittee. So it's entertainment, it's logistics, souvenirs, the children's programs, uh, our partners, sponsorships, behind the scenes, all of that. We got reports on all of that and everything's going well, moving forward. Well, we meet every other week from now until um, March, and then in March we start meeting every week. The steering committee will meet with the various subcommittees. The subcommittees are also meeting on their own, so they have their own schedules and meetings. So lots of meeting going on to bring it all together. Tonight was thanking our patron sponsors. These are individuals or couples who support the festival and, um, and also trying to bring some more in. We have a goal of having about 100 and those are going to be our sustaining sponsors. It's, a, it's this amazing organization and it's this amazing event that I want to be a success because it's a, it does nothing but help our community. The festival is now nationally recognized by Sunshine Artists, and that is a very objective uh, ranking based on art sales by artists. So that is really impressive that here in Tallahassee, Florida, we're in the top 100 fine art festivals in the nation. That's amazing. This is the actual art piece for the year by Debo Groover. Oh! Yeah, that was kind of a last minute idea. Hey, let's unveil the art. Um, but we'll probably do that again, and um, people like to see the original piece. Oh, it's amazing. I, I, I've been painting for several years now, and there are colors in that painting that are stunning. I would love to be able to recreate that. And it's, I can't tell you how hard that is, never mind the composition, which is just brilliant. It's, it's, it's wonderful. Hey, how are you? Can we come in? Please, come on in. So this is uh, Souvenir Central for the festival right now. We've got several boxes of t-shirts. We've got ladies t-shirts, men's t-shirts, artists t-shirts, all kinds of colors and sizes and styles. Um, we've got our note cards that are printed and have now been put in these little cello envelopes for sale. This year we've got our new stainless steel a tumbler with the image and the logo on it. We're excited about this one. It's insulated and it's part of our going green effort, so it's reusable. Thursday, we um, do our last minute uh, 
meeting, you know, is there anything else that anybody needs to do and, and uh, just confirm that we're all set. And uh, Friday the artists roll in and start setting up all the tents. It's, it's a lot of work to pull something off and make sure that it's, it's as good as it can be. Uh, we think about every single aspect of it. We want the visitors to have a wonderful time. We want all the vendors to um, make the money that they need to make um, so that they'll come back and feel good about the festival and, and the artists. It, it all revolves around the artists and um, having the best quality art there. And it's a cultural event. We're celebrating Tallahassee and in the heart of downtown. And um, it's just beautiful art and lots of local culture. And I, I, I just think it's, it's fun and um, something that brings the community together. The 2017 Lemoyne Chain of Parks Festival will take place Saturday and Sunday, April 15th and 16th. For parking information, schedules, or more information about the artists, go to chainofparks.org. Remember, you can always see more Local Roots stories and episodes on our website. Go to wfsu.org slash localroots. Also, like our Facebook page to stay up to date on our plans for future episodes. Thank you for joining us for this week's Local Roots. I'm Suzanne Smith at the Tallahassee Museum. For everyone at WFSU Public Media, thanks for watching. Have a great week, everyone. Gulf winds blow through canopy roads all the way to Thomasville. The maiden names written on the land echo through the red clay hills. Where the scent of long leaf float and pine reach up on past that Georgia line. Stroll through Tallahassee Town or Southern Appalachia bound Take the local roads and journey down the roads we call our home Take the local roads and journey down the roads we call our home Production support for Local Roots provided by